glorified and, and returned to heaven. And, and indeed, this also is seen on the very first page of
morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Good Let's try it again. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to start our worship with um, hymn number 672, Spirit of the Living God. see everyone here today. Uh, when I look around, I, I try not to watch the local news, but I like to keep my eye on, on global news. And um, according to the U.S. government, there are 10 wars currently being fought around the world as we speak. 10. There are uh, eight more that are considered armed conflicts. And in over 64 countries, there are more armed conflicts going on. The real battle going on is the battle for your mind. Uh, if we look at the things that can distract us, that can keep us distracted from God, that's the real battle that's going on right now. If we can keep ourselves from being caught up in a world of fear, then we will hold on to God. If we are so caught up and consumed in the worldly things, whether that's uh, pursuing our careers or, or our worldly passions, we're going to miss out on, on something huge that's going to have everlasting uh, effects and consequences. We have a few uh, announcements today. I just want to go through them. Peter, would you like to come up? Peter wants to speak on some things here first. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I hope uh, you can see my whole face now because of this. Anyhow, um, those who have taken, what do you call that, uh, these lessons from me, I cannot remember. There were about over 10 anyway on lessons on Daniel Revelation and Discovery. And so far, I have only this one back. So I hope that you will be inspired to find your friends or your neighbors or somebody to study with you. Because this is to help you to be inspired for the Word of God. Can I ask Rachel to come here? Because I want her to read now another story, what we have to do for people who are doing God's work. Okay, all right. Go ahead. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. As the prince of life, he had power with God and prevailed for his people. This Savior, who prayed for those that felt no need of prayer and wept for those that felt no need of tears, is now before the throne to receive and to present to his Father the petitions of those whom he prayed on earth. The example of Christ is for us to follow. Prayer is a necessity in our labor for the salvation of souls. God alone can give the increase of the seed we sow. 
We fail many times because we do not realize that Christ is with us by his spirit as truly as in the days of his humiliation he moved visibly upon the earth. The lapse of time has wrought no change in his parting promise to his apostles as he was taken up from them into heaven. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. He has ordained that there should be a succession of men who derive authority from the first teachers of the faith for the continual preaching of Christ and him crucified. The great teacher has delegated power to his servants who have this treasure in earthen vessels. Christ will superintend the work of his ambassadors if they wait for his instruction and guidance. With an earnestness and faith that will not be denied, they will plead with God that they may be strengthened and fortified for duty and for trial, and that their lips may be sanctified by a touch of the living coal from off the altar to speak the words of God to the people. The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He, awake, he wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Christ said to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Who can estimate the result of the prayers of the world's Redeemer? When Christ shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, then will be seen and realized the value of his earnest prayers while his divinity was veiled with humanity. Christ pleaded not only for one, but for all his disciples. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. His eye pierced the dark veil of the future and read the life history of every son and every daughter of Adam. He felt the burdens and sorrows of every tempest-tossed soul that the earnest prayer included with his living disciples, all his followers to the close of time. That prayer embraces even us. When all human support fails, then Jesus comes to our aid and his presence scatters the darkness and lifts the cloud of gloom. Thank you. Now I will ask Robert to come up here. Now, as he is coming up, I am going to tell you that it is very important that these messages are coming directly from God. And if we want to be prepared for his coming, we got to do it. And this is one of them, to make you active so that you'll be ready for his coming to welcome Jesus. Now I'm going to ask him, because he bought the whole set why he did that. Can you just speak to the phone? The reason why I bought the whole set is because I want to learn more about God. Because to learn, to know God is to love God. To love God is to know God. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And this is the appointment now. I have to wait. I'm sorry, the other, this person will have to wait because I ordered the rest of it and they have to wait for two weeks. You see, we try to save money. So we don't order everything together. We only order first and second lesson. So this person already sent in the first lesson. The person is not here, so I'm not going to tell you the name. But I am so glad that this person who is studying with another person had done so in bravery. And to have that bravery, we've got to pray. So would you pray with me now so that for everyone that has received this lessons and also for people who are giving out great controversy. Do you know this morning I heard just before I come to church, you know who you will never imagine? Pastor Finney was right down there near the general conference area knocking doors giving out great controversy, which I was doing, which some of you will know. You can ask Michelle, you can ask Rachel. I know because someone told me they were doing, and we did it together, and we know what happened. It was excellent. So this is our duty. So would you now pray with me to bless all these people, to give them the wisdom, the bravery to go and get this done because they already received over 10 people 
I don't know who they are. So please, do that. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your care. We thank you for your love. And we thank you that Jesus was on earth and was praying for us. So please, help us today. Help us. Help those who have taken these lessons to have the wisdom, to have the inspiration to still go forward and not give up. We pray that this is something that will prepare us to meet you because your commission is go into the, all the world, teaching the gospel and baptizing them. So please help each one, all who are here and who are not here that have taken this lesson. So please be with them and be with each one of us in the church as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. The BC Conference will be holding a Zoom meeting this Thursday at 7 p.m. It'll be on the church website for uh, everyone. Everyone's welcome to, uh, to attend that. The ladies with a June birthday. Uh, if you didn't receive an invitation for a little group celebration, um, please see Anne, and there's a phone number listed there as well. Uh, we are hiring for a summer day camp administrator, and ADRA is also hiring in several positions there. There's a young couple to my right here, uh, Lori. Just raise your hand, Lori. Thank you. Uh, she has some Uncle Arthur children's storybooks, the complete set, 1 to 10 there. If anyone would uh, like them or like to use them, please come see Lori afterwards. Uh, there is a there is a man. He is the husband of my wife's boss. His name is Garfield, and he is having some real health concerns. Apparently, he's had is it three strokes he's had, and he's partially paralyzed. One side of his body is partially paralyzed. And he's really struggling with this, not just physically, but mentally, how to deal with this. He's not that old of a man, and, and he's really trying to determine what kind of a future he has. Um, he has children, he has a wife, he has a family. So uh, for those of you that want to include him in your prayers, that would be muchly appreciated. I appreciate that uh, as well. Now, looking at our birthdays, um, I was quite surprised by something here. Do you want to stand up, Dave? <laughs> this young fella here, who was just baptized, who is a member of our family, his birthday is today. Happy birthday. How old are you? Wow, 15. What a great age. How many remember what it was like? Terry, do you remember what it was like to be 15? I had good times when I was 15. Thank you, Dave. I was more trouble than I was worth, but I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <clears throat> tomorrow, Vern. Denny. Tomorrow? Wow, okay. Vern's birthday is tomorrow. Mia, tomorrow? Not tomorrow. Coming soon. Okay. And on the 13th, how many do we have? We have Jada, Marlene, Terry, and Blair on the 13th. So. Quite a collection, so uh, if you know these people, please say happy birthday to them, and that'd be fantastic. I'll turn it over to our praise team. Thank you. Okay, our next song will be 185, Jesus is all the world to me. 185. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without Him I would fall. When I am sad to Him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, He makes me glad, He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend 
golden grain, sunshine and rain, harvest of grain, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. I know whom I have believed. Christian soldiers. Oh 
shelter in the time of storm, five to eight. And may I have you please stand.
those of you that are able, we invite you to kneel as we come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you on bended knee and we seek your presence. We invite your Holy Spirit into our heart and into this church, Lord. May your will be done. May your presence be felt, Lord. And we ask that you will continue to bless and heal us as a community, as an organization, and as a country, Lord. We thank you for taking care of us and for loving each and every one of us here. And for bringing us here this morning. You are our refuge and our strength, and in you we will turn and look to. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Before we go any further, I, I see a few people here that I, I don't recognize, and uh, I, if I don't recognize them, well, I, I don't know if anyone else does, so would it be okay if everyone just turned around and said, good morning, happy Sabbath to your neighbor in front of you and behind you, beside you? Let's just take a moment. Our tithe and offerings this week is for the North American Division's Women Ministry. Uh, we appreciate the women in our homes and in our churches, and uh, we would be in trouble without them. So we, we understand that uh, this is a ministry that is something that is well worth uh, contributing to, and so I ask you to uh, keep this in your, in your thoughts and your tithes and offerings. If the deacons could please stand. Heavenly Father, we humbly thank you, Lord, for all that you have blessed us with and, and given us and your plans for us. We ask that you will bless this offering, Lord, and see fit to it. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in your name. Amen.
Now is the time for our children's story, and that is going to be brought to us this morning by Vern. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So today's story is more of, um, let me see, an infomercial. Do you know what an infomercial is? It's like the advertisement trying to sell you something. So that's what it's going to be. All right, so first of all, let me start off by asking you, who here wants to go to heaven? Oh, lots of hands. Not many out here. <laughs> <laughs> Not feeling too hopeful. <laughs> but that's okay. We'll keep them in our prayers. God can work miracles. Well, I had a young man ask me one time, what's so great about going to heaven? Wow. You know, he believed in Jesus. He believed in heaven. He knew all that was real. But he had someone tell him that, yeah, Jesus will come back to earth, and he will take those who want to go back to heaven with him, with him. And the rest of them will stay behind and live just like they have all along, where you grow, you go to school, you finish school, you get a job, make some money, maybe get married, buy a house, a car, raise some kids till they're ready to leave the house, and then hit 65, retire, and then enjoy life. Wow. Can you imagine not enjoying life till you're 65? Man, I got a birthday tomorrow, not, not anywhere near 65, but I'm enjoying life now. So I don't, I don't buy it. So when he asked me, what's so great about going to heaven? Well, instantly I thought, well, don't get me started. I said, wow. I thought, okay. The first thing that came to my mind was, well, we're going to not get sick. We're going to be healthy. And, you know, we're not going to have to worry about uh, living in a one-story house because we're not going to be able to climb the stairs when we get old. We'll be able to do that, no problem. <clears throat> So you know, we'll be healthy, we won't catch diseases, we won't get cancer, we won't, we won't get all those diseases. So it'll be great, so we'll be healthy. First thing that came to mind, yeah, we'll be healthy. Well, <clears throat> yeah. but wait, there's more. When we get to heaven, I'm told we're gonna get a set of wings. Wow, when I get to heaven, I get wings, I'm not gonna walk for about the first 100 years. I'll fly everywhere as I go. In fact, uh, if you ask me, hey, let's race down to the tree of life. I'll say, okay, one, two, three, go, and I'll let you get a head start. I'll be a nice guy, and then I'll cheat. I'll fly. And I'll get there, and we'll laugh about it. We'll eat fruit from the tree of life. It'll be great. But wait, there's more. I'm told when we get to heaven, we're going to be a slight bit taller. Does anyone know of any tall people in the Bible? Any giants, maybe? Adam? What about Goliath? How tall was Goliath? You know how tall he was? Anybody? Nine feet. Oh. Six feet. Ten feet? Nine feet. He was pretty tall. But did you know that his great, 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 I don't know how many greats, grandparents were taller and they lived in a garden. Adam and Eve, yeah, they were his grandparents of some way back. And Eve could have walked up to Goliath, looked down on him and said, young man, stop picking on the Israelites. You go back to your tent and you think of what you've done and you don't come out until you're ready to say you're sorry. Now, Goliath being the big meanie that he was, probably would have said, I'm not listening to any woman. Then Adam would have come over. He was a little taller yet and big. He just said, young man, you listen to that woman. And I think Goliath would have probably gone back to his tent and done a lot of thinking. Would have saved him a headache later, and David wouldn't have knocked any sense into him. So that's another good thing about going ahead. We're going to be taller. But wait, there's more. We're going to be smarter, too. 
So you imagine you take a bag of frozen peas and you throw them in a pot, Let's pretend that's your brain. Well, Adam and Eve, they used the whole pot. Me, I use one or two peas. Maybe three of them lucky, maybe. So we're gonna use the whole pot of peas when we get to heaven, so we're gonna be smarter and taller. And how about how we look? Well, you remember when God, because uh, Adam and Eve weren't born, they were created. So God got down in the dirt there and he started forming Adam, and I've seen kids with dirt in their face, it's not a pretty sight. But with Adam, when he was done, and he saw Adam, well, Adam could have been Mr. Universe. He was that good looking. Because God doesn't make mistakes when he was creating Adam. You know, God looked at Adam and said, that's pretty good, but I think I can do better. So he put Adam to sleep and tore a rib out of him. Okay, he surgically removed the rib. He put it in the dirt, he built Eve around the rib. And when he was done, he said, wow, that's really something. So there was Eve, and she could have won all the beauty contests in the, in the Garden of Eden, because she was the only woman there, but she was perfect. God didn't make any mistakes. So there's another good reason we're going to have them. We're going to be good looking, though. They were my great, 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 great grandparents, and I get my looks from them. I didn't get their height, but you can't have it all. But wait, there's more. When I get to heaven, I'm going to build a house. It'll be maybe 20 stories tall. And remember, I'm going to be 12 feet tall, so each of the stories is going to be pretty tall. And if it takes me a thousand years of story, who cares? It doesn't matter. If I wake up in the morning and say, I don't feel like building on my house today. I think um, I'll go to the planet Zogbog. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know. And visit the butterfly people. I'll build on my house tomorrow. That's okay. And if tomorrow comes and I wake up and I say, hmm, I think I'll go have a picnic at the Tree of Life. I don't think I'll build on my house today. That's okay. That's fine. And if I wake up tomorrow and Mrs. B says, why don't you go mow the lawn? I'll say, I'll do it tomorrow. No, I won't. I won't say I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it right away. I'll go grab 12 cows, one for each tribe of Israel. I'll guide them across my lawn, beautifully manicured lawn. I'll back them up to my garden, have to do the grass clippings. I'll have a good garden. And that's okay. And if I wake up tomorrow, and I say, well, Jesus is having a seminar down by the Tree of Life on how to build houses. That might be something good to go to. I'll build them a house tomorrow. That's okay. Because in heaven, you have unlimited tomorrows. You have all the time in the world. That's amazing. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so now I'm finished my house. It took me 20,000 years. I procrastinate. I'm sitting in the 18th floor where my kitchen is. Means means that I had to spend 18,000 years picnicking on my front lawn. But that's okay. I'm up in the 18th story in my kitchen. And I hear a knock on my door. And look at that. It's Denny and Mia. They're walking by. And so I stick my head out the window and I yell down, yeah? And they say, I see you finally finished building your house, you procrastinator. I said, yeah. Can we come in and look? Oh, absolutely. So they come in the front door. Then they come back out and yell up, hey. I said, yeah. You don't have any stairs in your house. Well, no. You guys have wings. Use them. So they'll fly up in through the 18th story window of my house, land on a branch, and I'll reach behind me and grab a great big pomegranate the size of a basketball off my wall, because my walls are made out of trees, not lumber. Lumber's too expensive. And I'll hand them each one, and they'll bite into it, and it'll be delicious. Best tasting pomegranate you have ever had. And all the food will be like that in heaven. Bananas, that long. Oranges, see, it's juicy. And it's just a flavor explosion in your mouth, and you bite into it. Apples will be crispy and juicy. Lemons will be, I don't know if the lemons will be sweet, but they'll be good. They'll taste good. <clears throat> and we'll have seedless watermelon that taste good. In fact, all the, the, the oranges will be seedless, the lemons will be seedless, the apples will be seedless, Pomeg oh, pomegranates can't be seedless. You've got to eat the seeds in those. But, uh, and you talk about grapes. You remember the story of the spies coming out of Canaan when they, uh, they said the grapes were so, the clusters were so big it took two men to carry them? You'll need a dump truck in heaven. The, the grapes will be so big. Clusters are great and juicy and crispy. And you'll even get to try some manna, some angel food. So the food in heaven will be great. So that's another good thing about being in heaven. I've just told you a whole bunch of good things about being in heaven, and I haven't even got to the best part yet. So how many of you have ever you know, been out playing, tripped, and skinned your knee, or banged your elbow, or bumped your head, stubbed your toe? You're sitting there, and you're, 
You're sitting there and you're crying and your mom and dad come over and pick you up and give you a great big hug and everything feels better. We have a lady in this church who was here last week, turned 90, she gives good hugs. I don't know if you know Mrs. Pearl Doak. She gives wonderful hugs. In fact, she seems to know just how much hug you need. You could give her a hug and she'll wrap her arms around you like a little bear and she won't stop till she knows you've had enough hug and then she gives you a little bit extra to take home in a doggy bag. It's great. She lets go and you're like, wow. Well, you're going to get a hug in heaven that's about a thousand times better than that. You're getting a hug from Jesus. And you'll go up to Jesus and say, can I have a hug? And you'll say, yes, my child. You can have a hug. And he'll reach out with his hands like this. And as you now notice, there's scars in his hands. Remember, they hammered nails through his hands into the cross. And you look, and there's scars in his feet, where they hammered the nails through his feet into the cross. And if you look close enough, you see there's a scar on his side where they put a, a spear into his side to make sure that he was dead. And those scars will stay there forever. They're not going to go away. And you're going to realize that he allowed wicked, evil men to put those scars in his body forever just so that you could be in heaven with him. So you go up to give him a hug and you'll say, Jesus, thank you so much, so much for being willing to let wicked, evil men put those scars on your body that will be there forever just so that I could have one of these most amazing hugs every day forever. And then Jesus is going to say to you, thank you, my child, for choosing me over everything else in your life so that I could give you one of these most amazing hugs in the whole world for the rest of your life. So <clears throat> that will be amazing, won't it? So let me ask you, who wants to go to heaven? <laughs> oh, that's a little better. Yeah, me too. I'll see you there. Thank you, Vern. Max, that's a hard act to follow. I don't know. That's a good sermon right there. Yeah? I uh, agree. We are blessed with some special music today by Denny and Mia. So we're looking forward to that.
Very nice. Thank you, Mia. All right, Dita, I'll turn it over to you. Dita has a presentation for us and as well as Radine. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we are going to start our program with how we usually start the year. This is an unusual um, occurrence, but we have um, an inductee at the very end of the year. So if we could have Amelie come up, please. Amelie came in the club about halfway through the year. Um, they were doing um, nominating committee. So her mom asked me, is it okay if she just hangs out with the kids? And then uh, that went on a little longer than normal. And then it was like, well, she might as well just be part of the club. So welcome to the club. I wasn't here last week, but I'm here very nice celebrations last week as well. So if I could have Amito, Dave, and Ochaya come forward, please. So we've had um, an unusual but still eventful year. Um, so we started the year with uh, mechanics and nutrition and cooking. So some of the older kids did the mechanics and some of the younger kids did the nutrition honor. Um, then things got a little different and we had the teens take over and they taught the red alert honor. and. Um, then we had Mr. LaFlock come in and teach art and drawing to us. It takes a lot of staff, it takes a lot of effort and um, community help to run a program that is um, well-rounded for the kids. So I just am so thankful for everybody that helps contribute to that. Um, we did digestion after that. We thought we'd continue with the theme of nutrition and cooking. So we ended up making a giant digestive system in the gym and then we got to whack the kids and spray them with water and silly string to um, represent the different kinds of things that happen in the digestive system. It was lots of fun. So um, the, the rest of the year we did camping and oh yeah we went to the, the Vancouver Island a year a couple weeks ago and we did some fossil hunting on the Trent River. And then we went caving at the Horn Lake Caves. So the last few days have been cleaning up and just having a celebration for what the year was like. So um, these patches represent the different efforts for the kids that um, they put out for this year. So we'd like to have Amelie come forward so she can get some patches for her new sash. Okay. And Mia. And Amito. Okay. 
can come up either. <laughs> uh, Denny. We have, we have a little fellow Kyle in our club and he was so looking forward to this all year. He's been asking me when he gets his patches, but he's sick today. So we have Ochaya. And Dave. Jayla. So the girls have little diamonds that will be going onto their red alert patch that they already have. And then they taught uh, health and fitness as well. So they get a little diamond when you teach the class, you get that. So that goes on your red alert, okay? Jesse. And Jonathan. He's well decorated. <laughs> All right. Um, so. so we have more, but um, like I said, a lot of the kids couldn't make it today. So as I mentioned, a lot of work goes into this for the kids each week. We have a two hour meeting. We could use a three hour meeting if we were gonna, this year we didn't do the investiture levels. Um, so whether it's parents or staff or volunteers or a community people, we get a lot of community people in to help um, teach the different things. So I would like to ask Jesse to come forward. And Jan and Lori and uh, Sandra. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> Come forward. Heather's sick today as well. And Jeff's not here either. So I just want to thank you guys for all your help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, so, um, it's, like I mentioned, been a big change this year with um, Sandra and John made it possible, as well as the girls, for our club to continue this year. We had at least three clubs close in BC this year um, because of staffing issues. So, I'm just so grateful that whatever's happened over the last couple of years that we've been able to go ahead no matter what. God has always found a way for us. And um, it's, been, it's been challenging sometimes, but I had Lori and Heather on the speakerphone, and I was like, ladies, we need to pray. And halfway through the prayer, God just said to me, you have TLTs. And so that was how we were able to continue um, forward with what we've done this year. And then we got Dita. So, um, I would just ask Jayla and Jesse to come forward. I'm really, really appreciative of these girls. Uh, so it's, um, Hannah is away today, but she also helped and helped teach. So I'm just excited to see what you girls are going to do in the future. And just thank you so much for your help and picking up where we could. So, uh, yes. <laughs> so on that note, um, we had a staff meeting in the new year and um, with Dita when she finally agreed to come on and be assistant director. 
And the thing that stood up my mind at that meeting was, I was afraid of you guys. Every time I saw you, you were like, Dina, we need you, we need you, we need you. So she said, if she told God that if one more person asked her, that she would agree to be um, the assistant director. So I'm so, so thankful that Heather was like, Dina, we need you. So <laughs> I'm, I'd just like to acknowledge that. And um, I would like to officially um, hand over my director pins. So Dita is going to be our new director starting next year. Um, I don't know if they'll get rid of me too easy yet, but we'll see what God has in mind for me. So. Just welcome our new director to the Mount Chiang Pathfinder Club. So it takes a team, it really does. And um, Dita has balanced um, my deficiencies hugely. And of course, Heather and Lori are amazing. And Jan and Sandra have always been there. So I just really appreciate all the effort that it takes for everybody for this. And. I'm also happy I won't have to do any more public speaking. <laughs> um, so Dita has put together a slideshow for us, and then after that, um, Jesse will do scripture reading. And we have our guest speaker today, Pastor Max, who um, is coming to us from Abbotsford, but we'll talk more.
Um, today's scripture reading is found in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Ray Dean, and congratulations to Dita. Uh, at this point, we'll turn it over to Pastor Max Davila, and we'll welcome you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Is it okay if I take, yeah? I like to walk when I preach. It keeps me active. today. Happy Sabbath, everyone. You know what? I always like to say that God is just so wise because he gave us the Sabbath for us to come to his house and we can rejoice in his name and just, just take a break from the week. And I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you need this break, right? Am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> Amen. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. And true story, I was looking for my Pathfinder uniform but I realized that it's in one, of, in, uh, in one of the unpacked boxes. We haven't unpacked some of the boxes since, since we moved to BC uh, last summer. So unfortunately, I couldn't wear my uniform today. But it's, uh, it brings me so, much, so many good memories to see you guys today uh, with your uniforms. And I've learned a lot of things when I was in Pathfinders. And I received God's blessings in different ways. And it's, it's just so beautiful to, to have such a community and have such a family that cares for you. And I'm so excited to see that you guys as a church support your, the, the kids as well and are there. And I, I always like to also say that, Raydin, you are such an amazing leader. Uh, and always there in all the pictures as well. And I'm pretty sure that the kids are going to take with that with them, uh, even when, when they grow up and, and go somewhere else. Um, so you guys are blessed to have Raydin uh, to, to be part of this church as well. Um, but before we start, I just want to ask you guys to bow your head so we can ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with us today. Father in heaven, once again, Lord, I just want to thank you so much because you are with us today. And I want to ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit today as, so we can open our hearts and we can open our minds so you can talk to us this morning. 
Whatever the situation we are facing today, allow us to have peace, allow us to have comfort, allow us to hear your voice this morning. Everyone in this church came here, not because they want to hear the words of a young man, but they came here to have an encounter with you. Don't allow us to go home with, an, with the feeling that we have come to your church and have wasted our time, but allow us to go back home with the feeling that today we made you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you that don't know me, I am uh, the chaplain of Fraser Valley Adventist Academy. It's one of our Christian schools, Adventist schools in Alder Grove. And I know that you guys also have a school here in Chilliwack from, I believe, K to 9, K to 8. So if you guys have any, any, any of your kids or grandchildren that are in high school, don't forget that we also have a high school at Fraser Valley. Um, one of the biggest problems that I find, especially with youth, is that so often they are defined by, by what other people say about them. And through the Bible, we see that a lot of people also have that, that kind of problems at the beginning before they even had an encounter with God. And, and that's an identity problem. A couple of thousand years ago, there was a rabbi who was walking, and he, he was on a journey to get into the, 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 one of the Roman cities back then. And as you guys know, back in that moment, Roman soldiers were paid to just watch you know, on the walls and see who was coming. So that when this rabbi was approaching the city, this, one of the Roman soldiers saw him and he yelled at him and said, Hey, why, why are you here? Who are you and why are you here? When the rabbi heard that question, he looked at the soldier and said, Well, how much does the Roman Empire pay you to stand on that wall and ask that question to every single traveler? When the Roman soldier heard that question, he was a little bit upset because the, the man was not answering to his question. He was the authority there. So the Roman soldier once again asked and said, Sir, with all due respect, just answer the question, who are you and why are you here? Why are you be visiting us today? The rabbi looked at him once again and said, I don't mean to disrespect you, soldier. All I want to know is how much does the Roman Empire pay you to stand on that wall every single day and ask the question to everyone. The soldier realized that this old man was a rabbi in Pakistan. They, they respected the rabbis because they were teachers of the law. And the soldier said, well, that's fine. I'm going to answer to your question. The Roman Empire pays me 20 drachmas to stand on this wall and ask that question every day. To which the rabbi answered, I am willing to pay you double that amount if you come to my house every day. And ask me that question. Who are you? And why are you here? And I can finish today's sermon with that question. And I can ask you guys to just go home and meditate on that question. And just analyze your life. Who are you? Why are you here today? You know, so often we, we find ourselves just coming to church every single Sabbath. Because it's a costume. We do it because other people do it. But the real question that I want to ask you today, not only to the youth, is who are you? And don't, and don't, and don't pull out your wallet and show me your, your license or your ID and say, you know, this is my name, this is where I'm from, uh, this is my address, this is how tall I am, this is, uh, this is the, the color of my eyes, the color of my hair. That's not the question that I'm asking you today. The question goes much deeper. And the reality of the gospel, my friends, is that from Genesis to Revelation, we see the same question that comes from God every time he wants to change the life of a man or a woman in the scripture. If we open our Bibles right to the beginning of the book of Genesis, we see that right when, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they, they were hiding from God, God came down to the garden of Eden and he asked a simple question in chapter 3 and he says, Adam and Eve, where are you? And he goes around the garden and, say, and asking the same question once again. Adam, Eve, where are you? I'm looking for you guys. And it's not that God didn't know where Adam and Eve were, but the question was much, much deeper than that. He wanted to, them to realize what they've done. And the cycle of our story, in, like in, in, in the, the human cycle, has been us running away from God since then. And God always chasing us. So, 
Today, I want to help you guys understand your purpose. I want to help you guys understand who you are and what is it that God wants you to do in your life. The other story is there was a soldier, two soldiers, who were lost in the wilderness. And uh, the sun was coming down, and they realized that they needed to go back to the camp, but they, they, they forgot the way to go back to the camp. So one of the soldiers looked at the other one and said, you know what, we should go south. And the other soldier said, no, I don't think we should go south. I think we should go north. That, that's where the camp is. And after a couple of minutes, they were, they were discussing that, uh, whether they should go south or north. And they came to the agreement that they should go west. So they started walking west. A couple hours went by. And they couldn't find the way back to the camp. And the sun was going down and down. It was getting darker as well. And suddenly they saw far away, there was a figure, a, man, a figure of a man who was, a, was coming the, 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 their way. So one of the soldiers looked at the other one and said, you know what? I think that's, that's the enemy. Because they were in, in an enemy area. And we, we're dead right now. Because we, we don't have our weapons with us. And what about if this man like, has an army behind him? The other one being more optimistic looked at, looked at him and said, you know what? Don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's fine. It's totally fine. We are two and he's only one. Let's just hide behind the bushes. And just, let's just wait for him and see if he's an enemy or maybe he's, he's uh, someone from our army. So they hide behind the bushes. And they were waiting there and waiting there. And suddenly the, when they, they realized something so special, this man was wearing a uniform that belonged to their country as well. And they just got out of the bushes so excited because... They felt so safe. And they, and, and they went and, and started hugging this man. And it turned out that this man was a sergeant in the army. And they were just regular soldiers. So, and, and, and for those of you who have been in the army before, there's, there are certain protocols that you guys should follow, right? And th these, these two soldiers forgot about all the protocols, about everything. And they were just so excited because they saw someone who was uh, a friendly uniform. And they were just hiding him and jumping around him. And the, the sergeant got a little bit upset because he felt disrespected. And he pushed the soldiers and looked at both of them and said, Do you guys don't know who I am? The less optimistic soldier looked at the other one and said, Oh, man, now we're dead. Because we don't know where we are. And this man doesn't know who he is. Once again, the question is, who are you and why are you here? Let's go to the book of Luke. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 5, verse 17, moving forward. And I appreciate that you guys have heard this story multiple times about the paralyzed man. And it's so interesting that in this story, or in... Just to give you a context of this story, a lot of people that, that were paralyzed or had different struggles in life, uh, they, they were often perceived as someone who had committed a greatest sin and, and therefore God was punishing them for that sin. So as we continue reading this story in chapter 5, verse 17, it says right there, Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there was a Pharisee, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then, behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they saw to bring and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the house top and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And in verse 20, it says, when he saw their faith, he said to him, men, your, sin are, your sins are forgiven you. It's so interesting right here, right here in this story. Jesus is preaching to the multitude. But there were also Pharisees. There were also people that did not like Jesus at all. 
And so often in the ministry of Jesus, we see the same thing over and over again. People that did not like him. They were present every time he was preaching. Every time he was healing someone, they were also present. But they were present because they were criticizing him all the time. And then this man comes into the picture. His friends are bringing this man. And they see that there's an obstacle in front of them. There are a lot of people in front, in front of them. There's a crowd. Jesus is in the, in, 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 in the house, inside the house. They can bring this man to the presence of God. But yet, they find a way to bring their friend to the great Messiah. Lesson number one for today. Surround yourself with people that are willing to go above and beyond to bring you to church and want your salvation. Surround yourself with people that have strong faith that can take you to the presence of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And these friends take this this paralyzed man to the presence of Jesus. They tried their very best. And the scripture says that when Jesus looked at the faith of these friends, he did not look at the faith of the paralyzed man because he did not do anything up to this moment. He looked at the paralyzed man and says, your sins have been forgiven. And, and let, let's, let's expand the context of this story, friends. So you, let, let's look at the story from the perspective of the paralyzed man. Because so often we talk about the perspective of the friends and what Jesus does in this moment. But we never talk about the perspective of the paralyzed man. Let's imagine for a moment that this, this paralyzed man, he was just at home. He was just relaxing, you know, enjoying his day. And the sad part of sin is that when we, when we are guarding a sin for a week, it feels uncomfortable at the beginning. But when we're living in the same sin for a month, it's still uncomfortable, but we're getting a little bit comfortable. But when we live in the same sin for a year, we get so comfortable that it doesn't bother us anymore. The Bible doesn't tell us for how many years this man has been paralyzed, but he was so comfortable in his situation. How many of you are comfortable in the situation you are in? God created us to fly like eagles and not live like chickens. He wants us to succeed in life. And my young friends, God has a plan for each one of you, but we have to understand and we have to learn how to recognize His voice and the plan that He has for each one of us. And this paralyzed man was so comfortable in his situation and I'm pretty sure that he was just relaxing at home watching Netflix. And his friends come to the door. You need to open the door. You need to open the door. We, there's a man in town who is healing a lot of people. His name is Jesus Christ. We need you to take you there. And I'm pretty sure that this man in the living room, he was probably so exhausted because he probably visited so many doctors trying to find a solution. But no one gave him anything. No one gave him any, any solution. He was supposed to be like that forever. But it kind of gives me the idea that their friends were always looking for someone to save their friend, to heal his friend, their friend. So they come to the door, they grab their friend and said, it is, we need to take you to this man. And when they're taking him to, to, to the house, they, they see the obstacle. And I'm pretty sure that the paralyzed man looked at them and said, you know what? I know. Thank, thank you for trying. But it, it seems that today is not a day again. I don't think we're going to be able to meet this man. There's a lot of people here. It's impossible to meet Jesus. And how many of us sometimes when we have a dream in life, sometimes when we have a vision in life and we see the first obstacle, we just take a step back and say, Lord, I don't think this is for me. It's so interesting that how sometimes God wants us to work for our blessings a little bit harder. During the Cold War, there was a family who was just struggling to, to find bread and food to eat. So one morning, mom called everyone to the living room and said, guys, it is time for us to pray. I think we need to pray and ask God for, for some bread. We need, we need to eat. We don't have money. We don't have a food or anything like that. So this was mom's prayer and said, Lord, I know that you are the living God of the universe and I know that you can provide anything you, you, you want. 
All we want today is just bread. Can you please send us some bread? As soon as mom finished a prayer, guess what happened? Someone came to the door. And mom went running and opened the door. And guess what she saw outside? There was a box. Guess what was in the box? Anyone? No. There were rocks inside the box. The mom grabbed the, grabbed the box. She took it to the, to the backyard. She just threw the box there. And she called everyone again to the living room and said, Lord, maybe you're, you're testing our faith. That's why you send us rocks. But we're praying again because we believe that you can do a miracle today. Can you please send us bread? As soon as she finished her prayer, someone came in the door, knocked on the door. She opened the door. Guess what she saw outside? Hmm? No, there were three plastic bags outside. Guess what was inside the plastic bag? No. There were rocks again. So this time the mom just left the plastic bags there and went outside, called everyone and said, no, we need to pray again. And she prayed this prayer and said, Lord, I promise you that if you send us bread today, we are going to share the bread with, with the community, with the poor. And then she thought maybe someone is listening to our prayers and they are just, you know, are playing something on us. So she sent one of her kids to go around the house and see if maybe was listening to the prayer and that's why they were putting rocks outside. But no one was listening to the prayer. But as soon then she prayed again and said, Lord, can you please do it? Someone came in the door. She opened the door and guess what she saw outside? No. This time there were five big suitcases outside. And when she tried to carry the suitcases, they were so heavy that she didn't even bother opening the suitcases. She just left the suitcases there, went inside. And she was so upset with God that she prayed, Lord, I will never believe in you. You don't even exist. Then, unfortunately, they starved to death. When the police came to investigate, they saw outside the house, there were five big suitcases, three uh, plastic bags. And one of the officers was a little bit curious, and he opened the, the, the plastic bags. And indeed, there were rocks inside, but they, were, they had a lot of dirt. So he grabbed one of them. And he kind of like cleaned the rock, which was a lot of, had a lot of uh, dust and dirt. And guess what it was? It was gold. All this time, God was sending this family gold that, was, that had a lot of dirt. What God, wanted, what, what God wanted them to do was to take the gold, take it to the market, sell it, and buy food. Sometimes God is a funny guy, isn't it? Sometimes God wants us to work for our blessings as well. So I can imagine these people in front of the obstacle, the crowd right there outside the house. And maybe the paralyzed man says, you know what, this is it for us. I don't think it's going to work today. Let's just go home. And their friends looked at the paralyzed man and said, you know what, no, I think today is the day. We believe that today your life can be changed. Look, look up there. We can go through the roof. And they make it work. They bring the friend in front of Jesus and Jesus says, and the Bible says that Jesus looked at the faith of the friends. He did not look at the faith of the paralyzed man. Do you guys know why? Because the paralyzed man got to the point not because of his own faith. He got to the point because of the faith of his friends. And many of us are sitting on miracles today because of, my, uh, because of your parents' friend, uh, faith. Because of your pastor's faith. Because of your leader's faith. But their faith is only going to take you up to a certain point. And there's a point where you need to grab your own faith and believe that God can do it. And as we continue reading the story, it says right there, and we're almost done here. But when Jesus perceived that, uh, it's in verse 20, when he saw their faith, he said to him, Men, your sins are forgiven you. And 21 says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins by God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk. And in verse 24 says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, 
I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Sounds so simple, right? How many of you have ever, maybe when you guys were sitting, especially at camp, it's so uncomfortable, you know, those seats are uncomfortable. When maybe you're sitting on, your, on one of your legs for like 15 minutes, and then you try to stand up, and then your whole leg is numb. Have you ever experienced that before? And then you can't walk, like you don't have enough strength in your legs? It's so difficult to walk, right? I think we're not fair when we tell this story of the paralyzed man. We, we make it sound so easy. We have to take into account that this man has never walked before. He was paralyzed. And when Jesus looks at this man and says, arise, like, I can't imagine this man laying on the bed and, and trying to stand up. And it's so difficult at the moment. He can't give up. He's probably thinking, you know, like this is not going to work. But that's when his faith kicks in. And your faith needs to kick in if you want to see a change in your life. If you actually want to see the purpose that God has for you. So it was no longer his friend's faith. Now, everything was dependent upon his faith. So he stands up. And then Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, take up your bed. Do you guys know why Jesus told him to pick up his bed? Because his bed was his testimony. If he was walking in, into a room and he didn't have his bed with them, then no one would have even thought that he was a paralyzed man. But his bed represented his testimony. Parents, I want to tell you this today. It's lesson number two. I don't know how Jesus found you. Maybe when you were your kid's age, you were crazy. But don't hide that testimony from them. Tell them your life. Tell them the things that God has done in your life so they can see that the God of Israel, the, the God of the universe, was also present in your life and that the same God can also do miracles in their life. Share your testimony with them. Church, share your testimony with your, with your kids, with your children in the church so they can see that God can still, still do miracles today. And then the, the third thing that God tells this man is, and go to your house. Why do you think that God, that Jesus tells this man to go to his house? Mm -hmm. That is a good point. But maybe he tells this man to, to, to go to his own house because he can change the life of his family with his testimony as well. And there are moments where God tells people to come and follow him. But there are moments where God sends people to their house to also testify to others about the things that he's done in their lives. So, the same question that I want to ask you today, I want to finish with this, is who are you? If at this moment you are struggling with that question, I want to ask you and I want to encourage each one of you to just go home. Look at yourself in the mirror. And don't look at yourself in the mirror like when you're trying to, you know, comb your hair or brush your teeth. But stay there for a moment. Stay still for like five minutes. Just give it a try for five minutes and look at yourself in the mirror. And after one minute, it's going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. But then you're going to start realizing the things that you've been doing, wrong and good. And then, this week I want you guys to take three sticky notes and write down three things you are thankful for and put in your room. And take three extra sticky notes and write down all the prayers that you want God to answer and put it on the other side. If we, need to un if we need to know who we are and the plan that God has for each one of us, we need to have that communion with God every day through prayer and through the study of the Bible. But start first with prayer and talk to God like a friend. Today is the day of salvation, my friends. Today is the day that God wants you to have a true encounter with Him so He can make your life a testimony for others. Amen? And before we finish, I just want to ask you guys to please stand up with me so we can pray for our pathfinders this morning as well. We can ask for a special blessing for God. And once again, I want to keep encouraging guys to 
work for your pathfinders, work for your kids, be with them, and just share your testimony with each one of them as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you, Lord, because you're so merciful, and then you're just willing to go the extra mile to give us the blessings that you have to serve for each one of us. I want to pray for a special blessing for each one of my friends right here, the Pathfinder Club. Lord, you know that many questions they have in their minds. You know the many questions they have in their hearts. And sometimes it's so, it's so hard for us to hear your voice and understand the plans that you have for us. Right today, Ed, I want to ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with them. Allow them to feel your presence. Allow them to hear your voice. I also want to pray for the leaders of the Pathfinder Club as well. Give them discernment, give them wisdom, and give them love so they can share the same love and the same energy with the kids right here. I also want to pray for this church, Lord. You know, the struggles they face, you know, the dreams they have. Allow us to hear your voice and allow us to also walk according to your plan. Allow us to understand who we are and where we're supposed to be going at this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everyone says, Amen. Thank you so much. Please keep standing. We're going to sing our closing song, Take My Life and Let It Be. Hymn number 330. 330. Father, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And I think we appreciate that more and more as the days go by. Lord, I ask for a special blessing for your children and um, for the families that um, are here today. Please go with us, and we invite you into our homes. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>